So you remember just a quick recap. Last time we learned about how to find, well, I'll go back to this page first, find areas corresponding with particular z-scores in the standard normal curve. All right. So now what we're going to do is find, uh, we also learned how to find the z-scores corresponding to area, but now what we're going to do is focus on particular instances. All right. So where the mean and standard deviation are not specifically zero and one. All right. So there, there's a couple ways to handle it. <coughs> One would be to compute z-scores for any actual value that they give us. But fortunately, the NumWorks calculator can um, can handle instances in which the, the, the mean and standard deviation are not zero and one. All right. The trade-off for that is that we have to label the graph using the real values, which isn't as convenient. All right. Uh, so the distribution of weights of black bears is assumed to be normal, normal distributed, normally distributed, with a mean of 183 pounds. So mu is equal to 183, and the standard deviation of 121.8. We want to find the probability that a black bear selected at random will have a weight between 150 and 180. All right. So that's saying. Probability going from 150 to 180, we'll call that random variable in there, we'll call that X, all right? It's not a Z-score, it's just an X value, all right? So what we wanna do <laughs> is center our graph around the 183. Now it's like super small, so, you know, apologies for that, but we're gonna increment in units of 121.8. So I'm gonna take 183 and subtract from it 121.8. And it's gonna give me a 61.2, that'll be this value here. I'll make it a different color so it pops out. And then we're gonna do the same thing, but now we're gonna actually add the 121.8. This is a large standard deviation. So this data must be fairly spread out. Because only going just one standard deviation in either direction, we're already getting down to like, well, these, these are weights in pounds. So 61.2 pounds to 304.8 pounds. If I did one more step in the, in the negative direction, I'd actually get a negative weight, which wouldn't make sense. All right, but I need to go from 150 to 180. I got to kind of ballpark it. You know, somewhere half, a little bit, maybe more than halfway between 60 and, uh, and 183 is where we'd be living for the 150. So I'll just kind of eyeball it. And the 180 is just going to be a smidge less than the 183. If I could draw a straight line, I can't. I got to use the tool. I think a tool would know how to use a tool. And right, so I'm looking for this area here. So this tiny sliver of area. And right, that's going from 150 to 180. All right. Now, aside from using this to just verify that our answer is going to be reasonable, it does it does have value. <clears throat> it's giving us a sense of, I mean, 150 to 180. I mean, what, what are we looking at? You know, like, are these lightweight bears or are they heavy bears? You know, what are we talking about? But if it, if you're concerned that maybe uh, the population of bears is underweight because they're malnourished, then this would give you the probability under normal circumstances of that being the case, you know, 150 to 180, assuming that that's a lightweight bear, you know, and assuming that they're um, a wide variety of um, ages. I don't know, like maximum age of bear, you know, like humans can go up to, I think the, the record is like 125, 125 years, but, you know, something like that. I don't know what it is for bears. So, you know, like in the neighborhood of 20 is what, what you'd expect for dogs. So maybe somewhere in between, I'm not sure, but maybe this is a, this is, a, you know, 
a wide variety of different ages of bears, in which case the 150 to 180, if it's referring to an adult, it might be a lightweight adult, but if it's a, a bear cub, uh, it, it might be a heavyweight. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, inferences that you can you can make based off of this. Okay, so anyway, as for the calculator, all we're going to do is go into our toolbox. Let me just get back to the the main screen because again, the num works if if you don't you know reset it, refresh it uh, on the computer. It's it's going to bring it back to the last place you were at, and maybe that's not where you want to be. But we go to probability, we go to distributions. And we did this all last time, but I'll, I'll note it all in a minute. So probability distributions, normal, and then we're going to live in this interval here. So probability distributions normal. All right, so that's the that's the, the recipe for getting there. Now, what I want is the norm CDF range. All right. That gives us a start value, a stop value. So this will be my A. This will be my B. And we already know the mu and the sigma. So I want this one here. I want to type in the 150, the 180, the 183 and the 121.8. All right, so 150, 180, 183, 121.8. And we'll get an approximate area, but it should be pretty small, corresponding with that tiny sliver that I just uh, scratched out. So a little bit less than 10%. So 0 0.09. Well, we go to seven zero. All right. So only 10% of the bear population, assuming that, you know, I, I forget where I got this data from or the summary statistics, uh, in this case, parameters. But if this is legitimate information, and it tells us that the likelihood of us finding a bear in the weight uh, interval of 150 to 180 is going to be around 10%. So it's a fairly small number. But um, but again, we don't know what we're talking about in terms of ages of bears. Maybe maybe we just when we sampled, we sampled a bunch of uh, cubs, you know. So the information that we were given, same deal. So the mean and standard deviation of one eighty three to one twenty one point eight. But now what they want is the weight separating the top twenty five percent from the bottom 75%, right? We we definitely have to ballpark the way we did last time with 75%. I don't know where it's gonna exactly fall. So we'll just do a quick estimate. You know, I suspect that it's gonna be, well, I know it's gonna be more than halfway, but it's probably not gonna be too much more than halfway, All right? But you have a lot of freedom to get creative there. You don't have to, you know, some people, they um, they get the answer first and then they scratch out the graph. Either way, it's going to be perfectly fine. So this is going to correspond with a z-score. If we go back into our toolbox, we see the inverse norm function. All right, it, it would correspond, it would give us a z-score if we use the mu and sigma of zero and one. But what we want is an x value. All right, the x value corresponds to the real data. All right, so we want inv norm. The value in question, that, that A value is A for area, so 0.75, but now I put my mean, my particular mean of 183 and my standard deviation, my population standard deviation of 121.8, and it will give us the weight of black bear that would be at the 75th percentile, all right? So type in... 0.75, but that's not a five. 0 0.75, 183, 121.8. Oop, fat fingers strike again. 121.8. And so 
about so x specifically is going to be about 265.153 and that's pounds, right? But like I said, you could have also gotten a Z-score out of this. It'd be exactly the same as what we did in uh, the previous part of the, uh, the this particular page. Uh, but if I put a zero and a one there, that that's the Z-score that corresponds to this, um, this percentile rank. And so you could use the Z-score formula to come up with this number, but you know, if the calculator is going to do it all for you, you know, why not take advantage of that? All right. So that puts the uh, finishing touches on that part of the lesson. But now what we're going to do is kick over to something called the central limit theorem. And what this does is it, and you've seen it in the, uh, the tech assignment, it samples from a population and allows you to infer the population parameters based off of the sample statistics. So I'll show you an example of what it all means, but this is all um, textbook jargon here. You could read, you could read it, but I, I think um, between the tech assignment and what I'm about to show you, that you're probably better off with that, because most people look at it and say, okay, there's more formulas. You have this formula here, and this formula here, and that, you know that that's part of it. You know, pretty much everything we do involves a formula in some capacity. It's just knowing why the formula is important and how it works. That's really where we're at. So I'll take you through this example and also take this as a typo because I don't see the word example here. Makes it seem like it's part of the notes. Okay, so that's a typo for somebody. So we're given a population consisting of the numbers one, two, three, and four. We want to find the population mean bolded population, so population mean and population standard deviation. So we'll do that first. So here's my population. I'm just going to write population. Right. The population consists of only the numbers one, two, three, and four. All right. What we want to do is find the population mean, which would be mu, and the population standard deviation, which would be sigma. Calculator can do that for us very easily. It's a small sample, so you may just want to go into the uh, the toolbox and go under statistics. All right, it's um, oh, it's down further. Lists, statistics, and then you could find the mean and the standard deviation. Yeah, so that. That might be the way to go because it's just the numbers one, two, three, and four. So if I wanted to do this, I just select mean. So uh, let me just make a note. So toolbox, list, statistics. All right. So if I bring up mean, all I do is type in one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, four. Syntax error. Um, I was about to say that I've never actually used this function before, but I didn't say it because if it worked, I could pretend like I, I just know everything. But what happened is, since I've never used this function before, I just rolled the dice and I did not get a seven. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so I can try to troubleshoot this. Or we can go back to the way that we know. Let me just try one thing first. Yep. You need the squiggly brackets. All right. So it would be, in this case, mean, squiggly, little squiggly jammy there. And one, two, three, four. And as a result, we get 2.5. I mean, you're looking at the numbers one, two, three, and four, and you're finding the average. In in theory, you probably shouldn't need a calculator for something like that, but we, we know that 
this is the rare instance where the numbers are actually nice, right? So let's see if I can apply my newfound knowledge to the standard deviation. So into the toolbox, lists, statistics, standard deviation. Let's see, let me get rid of one of those. Uh, I got two open parentheses. I only want one of them. And it worked. Yay. It gives us the, the, the value in radical form too, which is nice. You know, if, if you don't want to worry about rounding. I mean, so I could write radical five over two. And that's approximately 1.118. You know, we, we tend not to, when it comes to statistics, you know, means and standard deviations, we tend to go in decimal form. But then, you know, like if, if the calculator is going to give you the exact value, you might as well just take it. Because right? then you don't have to worry about making a rounding error. All right. So that's the population mean and the standard deviation. So now what we need to do is create a list of all possible samples of size two. All right. So samples of size two. So that's where n is equal to two. From the numbers one, two, three, and four. All right. So what we do is we think about any possible way we could pair one number with another number from that population. All right. The the trick is because it's completely it's a it's a complete sample space, it's possible that you could have repetition one and one because we're not given a, a scenario here. We're not necessarily saying or we got uh, four students that we want to put in groups of two. Ranger school. Nice. Oh, it's good row. Nice. So it could be one and one. One and two. One and three. One and four. It could be two and one, two and two. We learned in probability that order ordering of values is important, not just the, the values themselves. You never know. The context may, may determine that you need uh, to consider both orders, right? So one and two corresponding with two and one, right? So two and three, two and four, three and one. Oops, too close. Looks like a 31. Three and two, three and three, three and four, four and one, four and two, four and three, four and four. All right. So these, this is the, the list of all samples, all possible samples of size two. For each sample, determine the mean. All right. So I'm looking for the average of each pair of values. So the average of the first two, one and one, one plus one divided by two is equal to one. Average of one and two would be 1.5. Same idea down the line. That's supposed to say AVG. It started looking like an AUG, like August. Uh, not my intent. but now it really looks like AUG, right? Comma, commas down the line, close them up. And we're gonna have to do the same thing with the next set in a sec. You do it now or we'll figure out the averages first and then do it in a minute. Uh, one and three has an average of two. One plus three is four divided by two is two. One plus four is five divided by two is 2.5. 1.5 to 2.5, three. All right, just adding the two numbers up and dividing by two. All right, so same idea going down the next line. And what we're creating is what's known as a sampling distribution. This is a distribution of all possible sample means 
when the sample size is equal to two. Just gonna relocate some things. There was a point when I had extraordinary handwriting. But then it all fall apart, fell apart in first grade. I always talk about the guy who scored the goal. I mean, yeah, he made a good shot, but the pass from Lindgren going to him, that was that was the key to that play. Uh Professor, I just want to say I I had had to rejoin the meeting because my internet where I am right now is kind of spotty. Gotcha. Not a problem. All right, so looking for averages again, there's more and more, uh, one, uh, three and one is the, well, if you just look at the middle point between two numbers, because the median and the average when only dealing with two numbers, they end up being uh, generally the same, because you know, you're splitting the difference between the two. So two, two and a half, three, three and a half, uh, two and a half, three, three and a half, and four. And this is a much bigger list. I actually have to resize a little bit so I can get, well, that looks terrible. Uh, resize a little bit so I can get a little bit more stuff on the right-hand side there. All right, so what I wanna do here is create a list of the sample means. All right, but I notice that there's some repetition. All right, like the 1.5 occurs a couple of times. The twos occur a few times and so on. So I, I might wanna make a frequency table out of this, all right? So I'll make a list of the X bar values, all right? Cause that's what all these things are. They're all X bars, they're sample means. We created samples from population and then we found the means, so sample mean. But I also want to indicate what the frequencies are that correspond to that. So the one, I only see one, one. 1.5 occurs twice. Two occurs three times. Let me get some more highlighter in here. Uh, green is up. Two and a half occurs one, two, three, four times. Three occurs one, two, three times. It looks like we're developing a little bit of symmetry here because the 3.5 occurs twice. Um, let's put that light red there. And then the four only occurs once. All right, so this would be what we call a sampling distribution. Ah, oh. whatever. So it's a sampling distribution. It gives us well, really the distribution of sample means. And so what I want to do is find some summary values related to this. Uh, I just wove right through the defense. So I could find the mean of this set of means. I could also find the standard deviation for this set of means. And then we'll see why we probably never want to have to do this again. Right? But if I go into the the home screen, statistics, under under data, 
I'm going to just clear out what I have here. Put these values in 1.5. Oops, sorry. 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4. And then adjust the frequencies accordingly. 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. And you know, for giggles here, I'm going to go ahead and throw in the original population while I'm here. All right. That original population had values one, two, three, four. All right. And we'll just do a quick side by side comparison on the graphs. So looking at the histogram, I can clean up the, the, the spacings here a little bit. I'll go to settings and make the bin width 0.5. I don't know that that's precisely a normal distribution, but it sure looks like one. It's got symmetry. It looks like it has the right, the right uh, general shape. You know, maybe it's not, but it's more likely to be a normal distribution than this. Right, this is a uniform distribution. Right, the ones, the twos, the threes, and the fours all occur the same number of times. One occurs once, two occurs twice, uh, once, three occurs once, four occurs once. Right, but we've created a normal distribution. And we we're talking about normal distributions in the last part of the unit with all that norm CDF stuff. So now I have the means to take a data set that's not necessarily normal and make it into a normal distribution, right? That's the power of the central limit theorem. So I'll go to my stats here and we're gonna go for the population mean, right? The mu is equal to 2.5 and the sigma is about 0.791. All right. I left a, an exaggerated space there because it's not the population mean. It's the population mean of all. Let me get a, a fresh color here. Something, something purpley. It's the population mean of all of those sample means. So we call that mu sub x bar. It's also the, the population standard deviation of all of those sample means. When you look at a population itself, the distribution really is that these are a set of X values. So when we find a population parameter, we're doing that of the variable X. Same thing with the standard deviation, all right? If I actually wanted to, I'll, I'll just kind of go back. You don't, I mean, if you're writing this down, you don't have to write this part down. I just want to kind of drive the point home. Let me get rid of this. I can make a frequency table out of this. One, 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 one. And you can see when I do that, aside from the fact that it's uniform because all the frequency values are the same, you can see that it's the mean referencing X. All right, the population mean referencing X. Whereas over here, it's the population mean referencing X bar. Let me get another color in here. Uh, I think I'm, I've kind of run the gamut here. Let's go a little darker. All right, so this is X, and this is the population mean and standard deviation of X. Now, what we're trying to get at is how these two things are related. All right, so... The central limit theorem, it's written above, but it's telling us that the population mean of the random variable X is always going to be equal to the population mean of all of the, the, the sampling distribution of all samples of size N, whatever the N is, in this case, two. The relationship between the standard deviations is not as clear. But since it's written right here, we can kind of just go with that. So sigma sub x divided by 
divided by the square root of n is actually going to be equivalent to sigma sub x bar. All right, so the sigma coming from this distribution here is going to have that relationship with the mean and standard deviation from this distribution over here. All right, it's just we tend to write the mu because it's it's understood that it's of the random variable x. So we tend to write it as mu instead of mu sub x. You know, we have all these um, subscripts all over the place. You know, like why why include one when you don't need to? All right. So we just generalize this to mu sub, uh, mu is equal to mu sub x bar, but we we usually write it the other way because that's usually a thing we're looking for is equal to the population mean. And sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma over the root of n. All right. Now, I haven't really justified that that is actually the case. But up here, I mentioned, uh, let me just go with a different color pen here, that n is equal to 2. All right. I indicated that the n value is equal to two. So if I were to take sigma, which we discovered to be 1.118 and divide it by the square root of two, get out of here, One about 1.118, we know it's not precisely that, but close enough. Oh, that's not a two, fat finger strikes again. We get about 0.791, which is what this value is over here. All right. And so that's the important part of all of this. You know, we already knew that the mean was going to be 2.5. That's the important part of all of this, because what this is telling us is that we don't have to do all of this stuff anytime we want to know what the mean of a sampling distribution is going to be. All right. That's really important because what did we have? We had a total of 16 possible outcomes. When I took the population of numbers one through four, we had 16 possible outcomes. But what if I wanted to know samples of size three? I'd have to come up with every possible arrangement of those four numbers. So it could all, maybe it's all one, 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 two, one, one, three, one, one, four. Uh, one, two, one, one, two, two, one, two, three, one, two, four, one, three, one, one, three, two, one, three, three, one, three, four. You know, and, and, and then we'd move on to the twos and then on to the threes. You know, it, eventually you, you notice the pattern, you, you kind of get to the shortcut, but it, it would take a little while. And also the original population only had four values in it. What if those, the original population, even if, even if I only wanted samples of size two, what if the original population had 25 values? Right? I mean, that, that's that's going to be a lot. Because right? really what we got here is four to the second power. That told us how many samples we would have. So that's our 16 samples. 25 to the second power is 625. You'd have to indicate 625 different possible outcomes. And then find all the averages of each. And then, you know, and then, and then, and then all the stuff that we just did. All right, so I did it with a very small example to kind of prove the point, but now we can just rely on formulas, all right, because we, we know that the formulas are going to work, or at least we demonstrated to ourselves that, they, that they'll work. All right, um, the first example on the next page, find the probability that the score is above 140, given 143 and, and 29. All right, uh, for the mean of standard deviation. This one I say is not central limit theorem. All right. So it's like, oh, we did, just did all that stuff with central limit theorem. Why, why are we not doing an example that involves central limit theorem? I want to show you how two similar looking examples, two similar looking problems, I should say, could lead to different approaches. All right. So we want the probability that the score is above 140 given that the mean is 143, 143 smack in the middle, and the standard deviation is 29. 
So 143 minus 29, just to get us our first tick mark, 114. We want above 140. That's really all I have to label because now I know that the 140 has to be somewhat close to the 143. And I'm looking for this area. Okay. So probability that X is greater than 140. That's going to, we could do it a couple of ways. The, the, the way I think I showed you last time is the norm CDF range. There's two ways to do it. Uh, norm CDF range where we start off with the 140 we'd eventually get to infinity if this were not a finite branch of math um but the the function itself goes to infinity we can't put infinity in there so we put something large and then the mean and standard deviation so this is the a value so quote unquote a this is the mean oh nope sorry that that is what it is it's large uh this is the mean and this is the standard deviation close it up go to our toolbox probability distributions normal and same place we got it before norm cdf range Oops, 140, something large. I mean, I don't know what the context is here, but I got to figure large is going to be something substantially bigger than 140, right? So maybe a thousand. The mean of 143, the standard deviation 29. And we get this decimal here about 0.541. All right now, I chose a large value of one thousand. I don't know if I went large enough until I do do the computation again with a number that's even bigger. There should be no change in the decimal outcome. All right, if the decimals are the same, if the decimals are the same, then you've gone far enough. So we're satisfied with the point point five four one. Also, when you look at the graph, I mean, we didn't shade a whole heck of a lot more than half of it, but we did shade more than half of it. 0. 0.541 is more than a half. So that's consistent. Okay. So that's where we've been. Now we're going to go on the probability that the mean score, right? So the mean score, key term there, is above 140. And then they give us an n value. All right, that's a sample size. All right, so what this is telling us is to find the probability, not that x is greater than 140, but that x bar is greater than 140. All right, that's what this is. It's the x bar, the mean of the sample. the mean of samples with size 100 to be more precise, all right? But in order for this to work, you know, I got to come up with a graph, yeah, but I need to not, and I don't need to know the mu and the sigma, I need to know the mu sub x bar and the sigma sub x bar. The mu sub x bar is going to be the same as the mu. The sigma sub x bar is going to be whatever the sigma was divided by the square root of the sample size. So sigma sub x bar is going to be 2.9. All right, so I'm going to label up the graph again, but this time, even though I'm going to still label in the middle with 143, I'm going to increment out in terms of... Uh, Incremental values of 2.9. I know that's a little redundant, but uh, I got there eventually. 143 minus 2.9 gets me to 140.1. 140 
All right. So that's going to be right here. All right. We can just assume that the 140 is just going to be a smidge to the left of that. But now I want this area. And so a lot of the numbers are the same here, but I definitely have more of the graph accounted for. All right. So norm CDF range. And in fact, it's really just all this stuff again. All right. Except it's mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. And it's not 29 anymore. Now it's 2.9. I mean, statistics is a weird thing because we, we go through all these uh, formative ways of, uh, you know, learning the material, like let's learn why things work the way they do. But ultimately, it, when it comes down to it, you're going to be like, all right, well, what's the difference between this kind of problem and the one that we just did? Here, we divide by the square root of n. All right, this thing is the only difference between the computations for something that's not normal distribution and some, I'm sorry, something that's not central limit theorem and something that is, all right? So I'm just gonna tug a little decimal point in there. Now you're not always dividing by 10 because you know, square root of hundred is 10. You're not always dividing by 10. So don't, don't get the idea that all you gotta do is slide a decimal place over. Sometimes yes, but most of the time, no, all right? So you might, I mean, it might be an ugly number, but you do have to compute it. So about 0 0.850. All right, so that's a big jump in probability. Again, it was find the probability that an individual score is above 140 versus find the probability that an average score a group of 100 individuals will be over 140, right? Depending on the scenario, that may be very much more likely and maybe much less li likely. I just kind of look at it like my, my classic example for central limit theorem is if I were to walk into a classroom and ask myself, all right, I, I need to get, I, I need one A student. I need to find a student whose average is in the A range. I could easily do that. Show of hands, is your, is your average in the A range? Okay, so that's one thing. You get a probability, maybe half the class. So 50%, all right? But then what if I were to say, all right, I want five individuals whose average is together given, given A, all right? So maybe one person's got an 80, one person's got close to 100, one person's a little below 90, one person's a little above 90, a couple other people are in the 90s, you'd have an average that's that's in the A range, right? But which is more likely to happen? You know, if and and that depends, it depends on the nature of the class, depends on what the what the scenario is, but you would expect that there would be a substantial shift in probability. Because okay? like to get a group of A students selected at random, that's the key ingredient. Because, you know, in, in classes, I mean, it, it kind of works out that way pretty frequently where it's like, all right, who are the people who are going to work hard? You know, like in-person classes, who are the people that are going to work hard? All right, let's all form a study group. You know, that study group compared to other study groups, that's what central limit theorem is talking about. All right. And it, it's a weird concept, but it's very, very powerful. Another example of it, uh, hopefully something a little bit more relatable. Although I don't even know how relatable this one is. Uh, math professors of IQs that are normally distributed with a mean of 125 and a standard deviation of 1.2, right? So it's saying the mean is in the neighborhood of 125. Now, when, just for transparency, when I created this example, cause it's all, it's, it's fictitious, I, I made it up, but, um, but when I created it, I had in mind that IQ tests normally have a, uh, a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. 
right? So, and we know from previous studies that if you're more than two standard deviations above the mean, then you're in the unusual category. So in terms of IQ, if you're unusual on the high side, it means your, your IQ is unusually high, right? So I'm saying here that the IQs are normally distributed with a mean of 125, but only a standard deviation of 1.2, which means there isn't too much variation from math professor to math professor, all right? Um, whether or not that's true, um, well, we all have our own opinions. All right, so I want to know probability that an individual selected at random is going to have an IQ uh, that's greater than 127. So X is going to be greater than 127. All right, so I'm incrementing by 1.2. So this would be 126.2. This would be 127.4. And I guess with that in mind, I don't really need that tick mark because I'm looking for greater than 127, which would be around, yeah, I guess around right there. So this little tiny sliver of area. All right, so that's what we're gonna find. And you know, like, uh, I mean, this is sort of tongue in cheek, but the idea was like, all right, if the real population has a standard deviation of 10, and math professors are already in the unusually high range, then we're all we're all incredibly smart. You know, that that's one aspect of it. But the other part of it is saying, all right, so if you're because this is around two standard deviations away from the mean, if you're unusually smart for the human race, and you're in this cohort of other people who are unusually smart, and then within that group, you're borderline unusually smart, you know, a second level of being unusually smart, then you'd have to be, you know, really, really smart, uh, substantially, you know, significantly, maybe even statistically significant, okay? But again, it's norm CDF. Uh, sorry, norm CDF range. 127 to something large with a mean of 125 and the standard deviation of 1.2. So norm CDF range, 127, I'll go to a thousand. I mean, contextually, if we're talking about IQs here, yeah, you know, a, a thousand. I mean, if 120 is already unusually high, a thousand is going to be uh, nowhere near possible. Uh, so we have this number 0 0.0478. I give it another look with an even larger max value. Same decimal. Now, if there's a natural cap, you know, like if you happen to know, I mean, I don't know enough about IQ scores. I used to say, like, I, I remember the ones like those, those, those weird pencil paper tests that you take in elementary school with like this, you have a triangle, a square, a pentagon, a square, a triangle. What would be the next three elements of that pattern? You know, things like that. But, you know, like in terms of a real IQ test, I have no idea. So, but let's say, let's say the most you could ever get is like 150, you know, maybe that's the highest score that you could possibly get. Then my large number wouldn't have to go as high as a thousand or 10,000. You just cap it off at 150, you know? So if there's a natural max, just go with that. Same thing with a minimum, right? Now in the next part, find the probability that 75 math professors, so that's an N value, Randomly selected have mean IQs, mean IQs, so that's X bar greater than 127. So same structure as the last question, just with an X bar. And, and you know, like, like I did before, all the stuff here is going to come along for the ride, 
except we're going to have to swap out that 1.2. All right, so I need my mu sub x bar. My mu sub x bar is the same as whatever mu was. In this case, the mu is 125. The sigma sub x bar is equal to the 1.2 divided by the square root of n. So divided by the square root of 75. And in fact, that's what I'm going to type in here. 1.2 divided by the square root of 75. All right. But I'd like to have a sense decimal-wise of what this value is over here. So the 1.2 divided by the square root of 75, it's roughly 0.139. All right, so that's giving us a spread value that's much smaller than it was before. All right? It doesn't seem like it's much smaller, but in terms of as uh, being a fraction of the original population standard deviation, you know, going from a 1.2 to a 0.139, that, that's a pretty massive shift. Right? And, and it's, it's even more illustrated when you start labeling the graph, you know, you start off with 125, and you want to go out 0.139. That gets you to 25.139. I'm sorry, it should have been 125, but you get the idea. I just lost 100. All right. Then if I want to increment it by another 0.139, 125.278. Maybe another 0.139. We're not getting anywhere near that 127 anytime soon. All right, I'd have to keep adding over and over and over again <laughs> before I even got to the neighborhood of 127. So I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, I think 14 standard deviations is what it would take to get us to 127, all right? So when, when you see me not labeling anything further, it's not because I'm forgetting to do it, it's because it's irrelevant. Because if I try to get 127, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I'd be in this neighborhood over here. Like, how am I going to illustrate the area to the right of that? I'm not going to be able to. All right. But it also gives me a clue that the probability is going to be minuscule. All right. So I'll, I'll crunch the numbers. Uh, let me go clear. I want to, how do you, how do you do it all in one shot? There we go. Um, 127 something big, mean, 125, standard deviation, 0.139, or you could just put in the 1.2 divided by the root of 75. It's going to say zero, right? It's not really zero. It's just practically speaking zero, right? So the, it's saying that the probability is so low that it would be virtually impossible, right? So it, we would say that this is virtually zero, which would also imply, so therefore virtually impossible. All right, it's, it's not, and unless there's some context that makes you believe this, it's almost never going to be exactly equal to zero because there, there is the possibility that if you go around sampling math professors, there's enough of them that you can, you can find groups of 75. Maybe you'll find one entire group of 75 math professors whose average is above 127, average IQ. Right? I kind of look at it like, well, it's hard enough to find one. 
Okay, so one person who's brilliant. Only five percent of the population, 0 0.0478, uh, uh, yeah, 0 0.0478. So if it's that hard to find just one, how on earth am I going to find a group of seventy-five of them? You know, it's kind of like um, if you were to rate teachers, you know, just like on a on a scale of one to ten, you know, like really good is ten. I mean, perfect is ten, but you know, nobody's perfect. Um, dead awful is zero or one. And you came up with a, a that ranking system and you, you ranked every teacher at the college. <laughs> There'd be some tens, you know, and, and it's possible that, you know, a, a 10 for one person, like a, a student will look at a teacher and say, that, that, that teacher was a 10, perfect. Couldn't ask for a better teacher. And then the person next to them could be sitting right there being like, what are you talking about? This person's awful. You know, so it's a, a matter of perception, but Let's say, for example, that these these numbers are accurate and every teacher at the college gets ranked on a scale of zero to 10. Okay? And I say, all right, I'm looking for any any teacher that's going to have a ranking of eight or better. All right, eight, you know, eight, eight, B level, you know, give, give me a B. Give me give me a teacher's B quality, at least. I don't want to I don't want a D, you know, I don't want a teacher that's not not going to you know, know their material, not be on time for class, you know, like not care about their students, stuff like that. You know, like, so you got the bad, you got the great, and you got everybody in the middle. But let's say your benchmark is eight. You go around the college, you, you poll, and you find, you find a few teachers that are eights, nine, nine and tens. And you're, and you're happy. It's fine. You, you, you got, you can fill out a course schedule and uh, you'll be satisfied that you have some, some, some pretty good teachers, right? But then if I were to say, I want an entire department of teachers, like the math department or um, the humanities department, every single one of them, you know, like, I, I want their average to be eight or better. And, and it's like, okay, well, that, that's going to be harder to find, you know, because you got to figure that there's going to be a dud in there somewhere, right? You know, like, it, that's just how it is. You know, maybe somebody's having a bad year. Maybe they're just, they're not long for the profession. You know, it's all possible, you know, but it's going to be much harder to find the group of people that satisfy the criteria if that criterion is far enough away from the mean. If the criterion is close to the mean, then you, you, you might have an improved probability, right? Because finding a number that's close to average well, by the definition of average, that should be pretty easy. Yeah. But there's a lot of really useful applications of this. And we um, we got into on the previous page about how it forms a normal distribution, which is why we're able to do this uh, to begin with. Right. Um, I actually wanted to change. I honestly have been meaning to do this for like, oh, it's got to be like a decade now. But I wanted to change this example also because it references CDs and people don't use those anymore. I remember, honestly, this is the, the second go around where I had to change number four because originally it was cassettes. So I went from cassettes to CDs and now it's like, um, yeah, they don't manufacture music the way they did in the past. Um, you can still get a CD somewhere, I guess, but it's all it's all streaming these days. All right. So uh new example. And again, I'll take it, I'll take anything as a typo. Um, as long as it it, it it is actually a typo. Now, let's say I have a distribution means and standard uh, means and standard deviations, uh, X's and F's. That's a skewed relationship. Right. So, and, and I'll, you know, what I'll do is uh, I'll go grade point average. So I'll say zero, one, two, three, and four. I'll, I'll, I'll leave off the, the half units. Right. So er, er, everything rounded to the nearest whole number. So let's say I have uh, four students who got F's, uh, four who got D's, 16 that got 
uh, that would be a C. B's I have 28. And um, and the A's, let's say, 62. All right, so this is the distribution of GPAs. All right, so I would want to find the probability that a student has a GPA greater than, well, let's get it to the A range, so greater than three. All right, and then I want the probability that a group of students, let's say a group of five students has a GPA greater than three. All right, so one of them is not central limit theorem, the other is, all right. But I wanna put this into, um, into the stat editor. So home statistics, Just gonna wipe this out. So we have zero, one, two, three, four. And this is, it's gonna be a skewed distribution just because it, well, it's not symmetric, but also you have, it's overloaded to one side as opposed to the other. All right, so I'm just going to take a look at the picture first. I always like to do that. It's right here. You know, the graph is on the way to the stats, so you might as well stop and have a look. Histogram, yeah, that's that's a skewed distribution. All right, now I wouldn't necessarily rely on our knowledge of normal distributions. It's not a normal distribution to be able to find this first probability. All right. Now, if this is a population of students, oh, and uh, whoever submits this for a typo, if you can remind me also when you do that to use the real data, because I, I have it, I wanna say it was from the probability unit. Let me just take a quick look. It was just something that was in a video. I, I didn't go over it directly in class. So, um, so yeah, this is going through fall of 2019. So, oh, that's another typo. This needs to get updated. So page 29, update the table. Uh, this was actually real data. So when, when I say something like it's a, a skewed distribution, I, I really mean it because if you look at the A's compared to, let's say the D's, that that's a pretty, pretty stark difference. You know, uh, historically, people wanted to fit their grades to a, a, a normal distribution where the C was the peak. So most students would get a C and it would just kind of feather out from there. I, you know, I mean, it's a matter of preference, but I, I figure as long as you're learning, then I, I really don't care how many A's I give out. I, I've met some teachers over the years where they're like, well, I never give out more than five A's. I mean, how, how can you say that? What if they're all like great students? So it, your grade is what it is. I don't force anything out of it, but this number might jump out at you. And be like, oh, you've been, yeah, yeah, you gave 247 A's, but you failed 96 people. And it's got to be over 100 at this point because there's still like two to three years of extra data that I need to put in. Uh, but I can tell you, and not that this is relevant to the lesson today, but I can tell you that almost all of those Fs were people who just, didn't complete the course. They just stopped coming. You know, why did they stop coming? I mean, the the, the reasons vary. Sometimes because they, they knew they weren't going to do well. But I always have this mentality of if you stick it out, work hard, do what you got to do, do everything I ask you to do. Even if the test grades don't bear it out, you'll pass the class. All right. So that, that's just like a PSA at this point. But um, 
but I figured I'd let you know that, especially since we're coming up on test three. Um, but anyway, this is the real data. It's a little outdated, but we'll get it up to snuff. I made this fictitious example, but since I'm referring to this as a population, if I'm looking for the probability of getting a grade that's greater than three, I don't need to do any fancy normal distribution stuff, right? Because greater than three would be here. So that's 62 over whatever this total is. So, uh, so 90, 106, 110, 114, I think. And it's a simple probability. So let me just get out of here, just so we have a little decimal for basis of comparison. 62 over a buck 14, about 0.544. All right, so in that context, because we're working with a population, you have the numbers right in front of you, there's no need to use a, a, a normal distribution. And besides, it would be inappropriate to use a normal distribution, right? Because if I look at this graph, if, if I'm thinking that that's normally distributed, then I got to go back and review my notes on what a normal distribution looks like, right? You may not know the ins and outs, but most people know symmetric bell-shaped, right? Total area under the curve is equal to one, but that's, that's the next aspect of it. Now, if I want to apply the central limit theorem, I need to know the mean of the population and the standard deviation of the population. So we stopped the graph on the way to stats, but let's go to stats. The mean about 3.228, I think that's an eight. And the standard deviation of 1.0432. All right, in order to apply the central limit theorem, I need to know mu sub x bar. Fortunately, I know that that's the same as the mu and sigma sub x bar, which is whatever my sigma was divided by the root of n, so the root of five. All right, because apply or creating a sampling distribution. Now, I mentioned before that if I needed to take the numbers that I have here, all 114 of them, and create samples of size five, I'd be at it for a while. All right. It would take take a very long time. Uh, just for the sake of curiosity, 114 raised to the fifth power. All right. So that's how many possible samples of size five I could have. All right. So we we don't do that. We just believe because we've done enough examples now. We believe that it will be a normally distributed a distributed uh, graph. All right. So I can I could do my uh, my num uh, num norm CDF range. I could just tuck that in there. But I also need a graph. So I'll steal some room on the bottom. CDF range three to something large, mu sub x bar. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna, I don't wanna shove it all in here, so I'm gonna tuck it in this whole thing down here. I'll just say. All right, so the mu sub x bar is 3.228, and the sigma sub x bar is 1.0432 over the root of five. All right, and this is going to give me the probability that any five randomly selected students from the population will have a GPA that's greater than three. And again, because we're going only zero, one, two, three, four, if it's greater than three, then it must be four. All right. Now, the large value, you can kind of um, you can take liberties with that because you could look at it and say, well, this is a school that has a maximum grade of four. So I could make the large value four. But you could also look at it and say, well, maybe it's not like that everywhere. Maybe some schools go up to 4.5, you know, a little A plus action going on there. 
you never really know. But uh, but you can never go wrong mathematically with just putting something that's absurdly and obscenely large. So toolbox, norm CDF range, three, something big, I'll put 100, 3.228. 228, 1.0432 over the root of five. All right, so crunch those numbers and you get about 0.687. All right, so again, that's the probability that the mean of the samples is going to be greater than three. Now, this is an instance, and this is why I chose this example, especially because the original data set was skewed to the right. The three itself would already be below the class average, uh, or the population average. 3.228 would be smack dab in the middle of the, the distribution. And so, you know, if I, if I describe a student as being an average student, that, you know, sometimes that 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 could be a hurtful thing to say, you know, like, oh, I'm only average. I thought I was really good. But if I tell you that, you know, the, the vast majority of my students are getting A's and B's, then we redefine average to kind of lurk in that interval. So it's the average, but only of students that are getting A's and B's. So if I say that you're average, I'm saying you're more of a typical student, all right? Uh, the 1.0432 divided by the root of five. Now you just can't hit the right key. I'm gonna go with typical as the word of the day, by the way, typical. So again, typical is the word of the day. All right, so my standard error here is about 0.467. So if I take the 3.228, knock off 0.467, just to go a little bit to the left, my first standard deviation is, is gonna bring us to 2.761. All right, so somewhere in, in the middle of that interval, you know, not necessarily precisely in the middle, but in the neighborhood of the middle between these two, these two tick marks is where our cutoff is going to be. All right, so the B student, the, the 3.0 student would actually in this data set be below average, all right? That's why, you know, it's so important to know, you know, teachers don't always want to share this information because it's, it doesn't always reflect well on them. But, you know, it, it's nice to know what the distribution of scores were when you take a test. You know, like, how good was the 85 that I got on that test? Was it a good 85 or was it a bad 85? Now, it'll still amount to a B plus at the end of the day, but... It's it's really a question of do I have room room for growth or is that the best I can do, you know? So knowing the distribution is really important because it allows you to know how you stack up, and not and you know it's not just not just grades in school it's just contextually that's the easiest uh, the easiest comparison, right? But this is what the graph would look like, and that it it, it kind of explains why the the probability here actually increased. All right from from three uh, from x is greater than three being 0.544, a little bit more than fifty percent of the population had an average better than three. But then I can look at it and say, well, if I wanted to have a group of five students whose grade is just a little bit below average to way above average, it sounds like I'm increasing the scope of what I'm looking for. So that should increase the probability. All right. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. So, I mean, and then, you know, you get into cases where 
I'll just show you. Because you could really play around with the numbers. You're like, well, what if I want to sample instead of a size five? Again, still probability that the, this group is going to have an average greater than three. But let's say I wanted 100 students. Okay, based off of the scenario, it's almost guaranteed that the 100 students I select are going to have an average you know, I mean, as close as guaranteed is, you know, probabilities will indicate 0.986. That's very, very close to one. You know, so it's saying that 100 students, I'm, I'm almost virtually guaranteed to have an average score greater than three. Okay. And then, you know, you want to get crazy with it. Right, a thousand students at this rate having an average greater than three is going to be in the neighborhood of one. Right, so it's it's really the reverse of the IQ question because your original query that one twenty seven was a number that was I would say far away from the mean of the distribution. It was almost two standard deviations above. That was your cutoff. So pretty far away from the mean. And because of that, we had this like this inverse relationship, right? Where the central limit theorem is going to lead to something that gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you increase the sample size. Right. Whereas here we had a value that that benchmark value of three that was pretty close to the average. And because of that, the central limit theorem is going to get larger and larger and larger or at least the, uh, the probabilities associated with the central limit theorem, right? It's pretty, I mean, it, it takes a little while to kind of wrap your mind around this and, and why it's important. But, uh, but I can tell you that next week when we do some work with confidence intervals, uh, it'll really drive the point home, right? Um, but it all comes back to this, just understanding how one distribution leads to another. And it, it took me a while because I created this. Exam. I didn't get it from a textbook or anything because I saw all the definitions like back when I was learning this myself. I saw all the definitions of like, how, how, how on earth does this work? You know, so I was like, let me take a small example and at least prove it to myself. And then, you know, from there, you build outward and you just, there's some things you take on faith because if it works for the small set, it should work for the larger sets. But then later on down the line, you start branching off and saying, okay, now, now that I'm convinced that this is true, what, what use do I have for it? Like, why, why would I find value in it? All right. And so that's, um, that's really more of this example, because now looking at a distribution that's not necessarily normal. Now, sometimes, you know, it's not normal and sometimes you're just not sure but it now does not matter if the original distribution is normal because when we apply the central limit theorem, it normalizes the data, right? And the reason why it does that is because when you take an average from a sample, you trim out all the fat, all the extreme values, they get trimmed away and you're left with only the, the bulk of the data in a central location. So that forces the shape of the distribution away from being any kind of skew, right? And if it's not gonna be skew, it's gonna be symmetric. And if it's symmetric, there's a good chance that it's gonna be normal. And as it turns out that this, this uh, central limit theorem guarantees that you're working with a normal distribution, right? Um, in case it didn't come through in all of this and you know my animated tone, uh, I really, really am fascinated by this concept and I, uh, I enjoy it, you know, so I get, I get a little, little amped up about it, but, uh, but that's enough for you to chew on for the evening. Uh, the only thing I want you to do between now and next class, because next class, we're going to apply the central limit theorem is I want you to work through, uh, just the videos, uh, 56 through, and it's all in the announcement 56 through 60. And then we'll get into test of significance next class. Now, um, we only have the one more class session before the test. So I can tell you two things. One, we're not going to finish this entire unit, which is which is never 
um, an expectation because in an introductory stat class, we want to we want to develop a little bit a little bit of proficiency with the hypothesis testing and confidence intervals, but it's really the more foundational stuff that's important. So if you uh, if you focus on trying to understand the central limit theorem, then uh, you'll be unstoppable when it comes to inference testing. Uh, the other thing is uh, I wanted to let you know that I am currently working on the revision to the practice test for unit three. So you could expect that to be posted in the next day or so. All right. So um, the the older version of it is it's it was the older version. It was a good test, but there's some things that we're not going to get to in this unit. And uh, it wouldn't make sense to leave it on the practice test. All right. So by I'd say by Friday, I should have that practice test posted, the new one, new and improved. And also I'll send out an announcement when I do that. All right. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to stop the recording.